Good morning and welcome as you join us this morning for this online service from Trinity Reformed Presbyterian Church. Uh, we're delighted that you have found us uh, and if this is your first time uh, tuning in for a service then we trust that you will know the Lord's blessing as you meet in this way. Just a few announcements for uh, our own people this morning. Uh, first of all, can I remind you that we'll be having our weekly Zoom prayer meeting at 5.45 this evening. And uh, the Zoom room will be open from half past five so that if you want to join just to chat and uh, have an opportunity to uh, catch up a little bit for a few minutes before the prayer meeting, uh, then you can join any time from half past five Five, and then we'll begin prayer at 5.45. And as usual, if you would like to volunteer to pray, uh, then please let me know. Just send me a message uh, and uh, I'll put you on the list for the prayer meeting this evening. And then we have our evening worship service at half past six uh, on our YouTube channel. The Home Fellowship Groups will meet as normal on Wednesday evening at 8 and Friday afternoon at 12 uh, and that will be by Zoom as usual. And Once again, if you aren't part of a home group at the moment and would like to be, uh, then let me know and I will put you in touch with one of the elders uh, for the details of that group. And then just one further announcement in case any of you may have missed it, and that is that there will be no Covenanter Witness magazine for the month of May. So apologies uh, for the absence of the Covenanter Witness in May. It's not being printed uh, this month. Well, that's all of our announcements. So let us now join together in the worship of God. And Psalm 97 says these words, The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, and give thanks to his holy name. Well, let's sing to God's praise as we turn in the psalm book to Psalm 104. Psalm 104, it's on page 252 in the psalm book. And we're going to sing stanzas 27 to 31. Psalm 104, 27 to 31. And here, as we've just been summoned in Psalm 97, here we rejoice in the Lord. We declare that we're going to sing praise to the Lord as long as we live, that as long as we have our being, we will give praises in song to our God. And then we have this prayer in stanza 30. Oh, let my meditation now be pleasing unto him. And as for me, I'll praise the Lord. I will rejoice in him. And we have so many reasons, don't we, to rejoice in the Lord. And this psalm gives us just a few. It speaks of his glory that endures forever. Uh, it speaks about all the works that he has done, uh, bringing him delight and joy. It speaks of how the earth trembles in fear when he looks at it because of his mighty power and majesty. The closing stanza speaks of his justice and his righteousness. And so for all these reasons and many, many more, uh, let us rejoice in the Lord. Psalm 104, stanzas 27 to 31. Let us sing praise together. Oh, let the glory of the Lord endure forever then, and let the Lord rejoice in all the works that he has done. He merely looks upon the earth, 
It trembles then in fear. If ye but touch the mountains great, it makes their smoke appear. I'll sing my praises to the Lord as long as I will live. Be pleasing unto Him, and as for me, I'll praise the Lord, I will rejoice in Him. May sinners vanish from the earth, the So come bless the Lord, O oh, praise the Lord with me. Well, let us join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. Lord our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we come into your presence this morning, gathered in our homes, so far away from one another and so discouraged by this ongoing crisis that prevents us from meeting together to encourage one another and to sing praise together and to sit together in the same place around your word as perhaps we are discouraged because of the different challenges that we face in these days of lockdown, we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will lift our spirits now and that you would enable us by your Holy Spirit to rejoice in you. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will fix our minds and our eyes by faith upon things above where Christ is, seated at your right hand in the heavenly places. Lift our eyes away, Heavenly Father, we pray, from everything that is discouraging, everything that is depressing, everything that is earthly, everything that belongs to this fallen, cursed world. Lift our eyes to heaven. Give us a fresh perspective, we pray, as we see Christ the King reigning over all things with all authority in heaven and on earth. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will help us to believe and to trust that the Lord Jesus Christ truly is unfolding the scroll of your purposes and bringing to pass all that you have designed. And that even this time of lockdown, this pandemic, and all of the challenges and afflictions that it brings, that even this too is encompassed within your perfect plan for the world and for the church. Heavenly Father, help us to believe that you are indeed working all things for the good of your people who love you. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will minister to us this day, even though these Sabbath days are so very different from what we are used to and what we long for. Yet we thank you that your power and your ability to bless is not limited or restrained or frustrated in any way. And we pray that you would reach down at this very moment from heaven and that you would bless us wherever we are, that you would speak to us 
from your word, that you would bring challenge or rebuke or encouragement or comfort, whatever it is that you know we need. We are so thankful, Lord God, that you know all about us, that you care all about us, and that you will do what is best for us because you are the only wise God. So, Lord God, draw close to us, we pray, and help us as we seek to draw near to you. For we ask it with the forgiveness of all of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's read together from God's Word as we find it in the Old Testament and in the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk and chapter 3, and we're going to read the whole of this chapter. I'm going to be thinking this morning about verses 17 to 19 in particular, but uh, let's now read the whole of this chapter. Habakkuk chapter 3, beginning to read at the first verse. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, according to Shigayan Oath. O Lord, I have heard the report of you, and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hand, and there he veiled his power. Before him went pestilence, and plague followed at his heels. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered, the everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers or your indignation against the sea when you rode on your horses on your chariot of salvation, you stripped the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. The raging waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their place at the light of your arrows as they sped at the flash of your glittering spear. You marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. You pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors, who came like whirlwind to scatter me rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters. I hear, and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will wait quietly for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. 
to the choir master with stringed instruments. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I'd like to speak now uh, for a few moments to the younger boys and girls. And uh, I want to tell you the true story this morning, boys and girls, about a lady called Ladley who lives in India uh, in a city called Hyderabad. And this lady, Ladley, is what is called in India an untouchable. She is an untouchable person. And that means that she is very, very poor. She is the very poorest of the poor. She's really no better than a slave. Ladley lives in a piece of old sewer pipe. Uh, not a, a little pipe, but one of the big, uh, enormous sewer pipes that you might see if you're walking past a building site. Uh, I'm going to uh, show a picture of it on the screen in a few minutes. This is where Ladley lives. This is the kind of sewer pipe that she lives in. It's not quite high enough for her to stand up straight. And it's just about long enough for two adults to lie down end to end. It's a horrible, horrible place to live. And where she lives, there are lots and lots of these old sewer pipes, and they all have people living in them, these untouchable people, these poor people. They all live inside these old sewer pipes beside the factory where they work. And the whole village of sewer pipes is horribly smelly. It really, really stinks because there are no toilets, of course. There are no bathrooms. There's no running water. The people here in this village, like Ladley, have hardly anything at all. And we know about this lady. We know about this village because one day a group of charity workers came to visit this village from the United Kingdom. And they were being shown around the village by the pastor of a church there in Hyderabad. And they were trying very hard to listen to what the pastor was telling them. But the smell and the sight of all this poverty was just overwhelming for them. And they couldn't really concentrate on what the pastor was saying. And as they were there trying to cover their noses and stop themselves from being sick as they were looking around this place in horror, what do you think they heard? They heard the sound of someone singing. And that was a big surprise because it was the last place in the world that they expected to hear someone singing. It sounded as if someone was singing for joy. They weren't singing a sad song about how wretched and miserable life was. It sounded as if it was a very happy song. And they were really surprised by this. And they thought, how can someone be happy in a place like this? And do you know who was singing? It was this lady, Ladley. And she invited these charity workers to come into her sewer pipe where she was sitting with her little daughter. It was very cramped. They couldn't all fit in, of course. And it was very dark and very hot and very smelly. Uh, and they all felt very, very sick sitting there. They looked around at Ladley's house, this sewer pipe, and they saw that there was a bag hanging on a little nail and it just had three small oranges in it. There was half a melon all covered in soot beside the ashes of the fire. That was last night's dinner. There was a battered old tin bucket. That was Ladley's kitchen. That was all that she had to cook with. Here was a lady 
who had nothing, nothing at all. One of the very poorest people in the whole world. And yet she was happy and she was smiling and she was singing. And these charity workers asked, why? Why is she singing? What does this woman have to be so happy about? And the pastor smiled and said, why, Jesus, of course. This lady, Ladley, is a Christian. She just became a Christian recently, and now her life isn't hopeless anymore. She has hope for the future. She has hope for her daughter because she knows that God loves her. She knows that God accepts her, even though everyone else runs away from her and doesn't want anything to do with her, even though to the rest of India, the rest of the world, she is untouchable. She's not untouchable to God. She's not unclean to God. He has received her into his family. He's forgiven her for all her sins. And one day she's going to live with God forever. Isn't that an amazing story? That someone who has absolutely nothing can still be happy and sing for joy because they have God. And boys and girls, that story, that true story is a real challenge to us, isn't it? Maybe in these days when you're not at school and you're not able to go and visit your friends, Maybe there are days when you start to feel a bit bored and a bit annoyed because you're not able to do all the things that you'd like to do. Remember Ladley in that little pipe village outside Hyderabad in India. God has given us so much, not just what we need, but so much more on top of that. Just Imagine if God took all those things that we have away. Imagine if you had to live in a sewer pipe like Ladley. I wonder, would you be able to sing for joy? Because even though you didn't have any things, you still had God. Well, let's pray that God will give all of us the strength that we need to rejoice in him, to find our joy in him. Let's pray that he will make himself the most important thing to all of us in the whole world. So that as long as we have God, we have everything that we could ever need. Let's do that now. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this lady, Ladley. We praise you for how you brought her to believe in you and to put her trust in you. We thank you for saving her. And we don't know today, Lord, if she is still alive or not, but if she is, if she's still living there in that sewer pipe in India, then we pray that you will bless her right now and her daughter and any other members of her family who are there. We pray that you will continue to give her the strength and the faith and the hope that she needs to rejoice in you. Father, we pray that you will help us to rejoice in you. You have given us so, so much more than Ladley has, and yet we take it for granted. We don't appreciate it. We pray that you'd forgive us, and we pray that you will help us to rejoice in you more than anything else. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's sing praise to God uh, once again. And this time we're going to turn to Psalm 16 on page 22 in the psalm book. Psalm 16 on page 22. We're going to sing stanzas 1 to 5. And here we find the believer... Uh, who finds his joy in the Lord 
more than anything else. He's thankful for all the material blessings that the Lord has given him, but he doesn't depend on those things for his happiness. Look at what he says in stanza one. You are my Lord. Apart from you, no good do I possess. Or stanza four, of my inheritance and cup, the Lord's the portion sure. And that which is my destiny, you will uphold secure. This is what made Ladley able to sing for joy, even in that utter poverty, because she believed these words that God is her Lord and that apart from him, she doesn't possess anything that is good. Psalm 16, stanzas one to five, let us sing praise to God. Keep me here, O God, I trust in you. I to the Lord confess. You are my Lord, apart from you, no good do I possess. The saints on earth delight me, I, the excellent old high, but those who run to other gods, their sorrows multiply. Please turn back with me now to the book of Habakkuk and to that third chapter that we read earlier on. And we're going to focus just now on verses 17 to 19. Habakkuk 3, verses 17 to 19. The prophet Habakkuk was tortured by the problem of evil in his nation. He had grown up in Judah under the reign of Josiah, who was one of the godliest of all of the kings of Judah to reign. But now he was living under the reign of King Jehoiakim, who was one of the worst of Judah's kings. And all the good work that Josiah had accomplished during the reformation that he brought to pass under his rule, all of that good work seems to have evaporated, leaving nothing now but idolatry and immorality and corruption. And in his distress, Habakkuk cries out to God and he asks why these things are allowed to happen. We see that at the beginning of the book, in verses 2 to 4 of chapter 1. 
O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you, violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. Why are you allowing these things to happen, Lord? Now, part of the answer to that question is given by 2 Chronicles 36, verses 15 and 16. Here we have part of the reason for God's inaction during these days of wickedness. It says in 2 Chronicles 36, 15, The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent word to them through his messengers again and again. But because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place, but they mocked God's messengers, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people and there was no remedy. So there's part of the answer, part of the reason for God's inaction. It's because of his patience. The Bible tells us in many places that God is slow to anger. He's patient with sinners. But then here in Habakkuk 1 verses 6 to 11, we have another part of the answer. Because although God is patient, he is not indefinitely patient. And the people of Judah have now reached the point of no return. And so God tells Habakkuk that he is going to send an even more nation, an even more evil nation against Judah to punish her. Verses 6 and 7, for behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. God is going to send the Babylonians to punish his people. But that, of course, raises another question, a new question for Habakkuk. Well, what about the Chaldeans? These Babylonians, are are they not guilty too? How can God bear all this evil in the world, whether it's evil from Judah, his own people, or from the pagan Babylonians? That's the question of uh, chapter 1, verse 13. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors? And are silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he. How can you stand it, Lord? And God's answer is be patient. The time for judgment has been set for Babylon, just as it was for Judah. That's the message of chapter 2. And one day... A new and perfect world will come. This will not go on forever. The day will come, it says in chapter 2, verse 14, when the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And so in chapter 3, the prophet Habakkuk humbles himself and praises God for his justice and his holiness and his righteousness. And we're going to look this morning just now at the great conclusion to this whole book of prophecy, verses 17 to 19 of chapter 3. And what we have here in these verses is some of the most moving words of strong faith that you will find anywhere in the whole Bible. Here is an example of faith, the kind of faith that every Christian ought to display in the day of trouble. Let's read again these verses. 
though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. Well, let's look at these verses under three headings together. First of all, in verse 17, we see disaster envisaged. Disaster envisaged. Habakkuk here looks ahead in his imagination. And in his mind's eye, he sees the land of Judah after the Babylonian army is finished with it. After this uh, Babylonian juggernaut has swept through Judah. And he sees this land that once flowed with milk and honey turned into a barren wilderness. Again and again in these verses, we see abundant fruitfulness turned into a desolate wasteland. Jeremiah describes the same thing, the same reality in Jeremiah 10, 22. Listen, the report is coming. A great commotion from the land of the north. It will make the towns of Judah desolate, a haunt of jackals. And that's what Habakkuk sees in verse 17. The nation is going to be plundered, he says, without mercy. A ruthless enemy is going to come and wreak havoc. The people will be slaughtered and horribly abused. And what Habakkuk describes in verse 17 is really the end of the world as far as an agricultural society like Judah was concerned. The land's resources, he said, are going to be stripped bare. Not just luxuries like figs and grapes and wine and olive oil, but all the necessities of life as well. Grain from the field, the sheep, the source of wool and meat, and cattle, the source of meat and milk. One commentator describes it as Bosnia, Vietnam, and Rwanda all rolled into one. It's awful. And Habakkuk tells us in verse 16 how he felt when he received this vision. He says, I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. He was horrified by the prospect of this invasion that was going to come and all the deprivation and all the suffering that it would bring with it. In other words, what Habakkuk is seeing here, what Habakkuk is describing here, is his worst nightmare come true. God's curse falling upon the nation because of their stubborn wickedness. It's what God had warned the people about away back when he gave his law to Moses. In Leviticus 26 verse 18, God says, If after all this you will not listen to me, I will punish you for your sins seven times over. Your strength will be spent in vain because your soil will not yield its crops, nor will the trees of the land yield their fruit. And now that dreaded warning is coming true. It's being fulfilled. It's going to happen. Habakkuk sees it in this vision unfolding in his mind, and it makes him tremble. It makes his lips quiver. He feels as if he's going to faint at the very thought of it. Disaster envisaged. And I wonder 
What is your personal worst case scenario? I wonder what would turn your life upside down? What would turn your world into a barren wilderness? And it may be that for some of you, you don't really need to use your imagination because it's already a reality for you. It's already happened. Maybe for some it's failing health. You remember times not that long ago when you used to be able to put in a 10-hour day and think nothing of it. And now you're confined to a chair or a bed. And you really get very little enjoyment or pleasure out of life anymore. Perhaps each day is filled with chronic pain that really can't be relieved very effectively by medication. And each day stretches out ahead of you like a mountain to climb. And what was already very difficult is now made 10 times harder because of this lockdown and you're not able to have the visitors that used to be able to come and break up your day. Maybe for some of you, it's the loss of loved ones, loss of a husband or a wife, a father or a mother. And intimacy and companionship have been replaced for you by loneliness and sorrow. Maybe for others, it's your marriage not turning out the way that you'd hoped it would. It started promisingly, and then somewhere along the line, things just soured, and it hasn't ever been right since. Maybe you're going through a difficult period at the moment that seems to be getting worse, and there's no end in sight. And again, uh, being in lockdown together, uh, with no relief from one another, no variation in your schedule, just makes things much, much harder. Maybe this time of lockdown has brought to the surface tensions and stresses and fractures in your relationship that had been there for a long time, but now they're being exposed in a new way. Perhaps for some of our young people, it's not being able to do your GCSEs and your A-levels so that there's no guarantee at all that you can get the grades that you need for that job that you'd hoped for or that university course that you were applying for. And then what about our nation? We're in the middle of a global pandemic. The United Kingdom, we heard last week, has the highest death toll of coronavirus-related cases in all of Europe. We're in lockdown with no clear end in sight, uh, no clear strategy for getting life back to normal again. And what about the aftermath of this virus? Perhaps you've read some of the many apocalyptic predictions of what irreversible damage is being inflicted upon the economy by this time of lockdown. And the collapse of our economy is being predicted by many. Mass unemployment. And perhaps after that, the breakdown of law and order and the collapse of society. It's not hard to imagine, given all that's going on in the nation and in the world at the moment. We may not have had a vision from God revealing these things that are going to happen. But it's not hard to imagine these kinds of catastrophes, is it? Because in a fallen world, tragedy is always a real possibility. We're all too aware of that at the moment, aren't we? Disaster envisaged. Question is then, how does Habakkuk respond to these catastrophic circumstances? Habakkuk tells us in chapter 2 that the righteous live by faith. And he's going to show us now what that looks like in practice. For a righteous man to live by faith, even in the face 
of disaster. Disaster envisaged. Uh, now, secondly, faith displayed. Faith displayed. And we have that in verse 18. Habakkuk said that the righteous live by faith. And that means that they trust God day by day that he is in control, that he knows what he's doing, that he has a perfect plan that is perfectly wise and that even though we don't know what it is and even though we may not understand how it is the best possible plan, we trust that it is. That's what living by faith looks like. And this verse is a wonderful illustration of that. Because here in verse 18, we have some of the greatest words of faith in the whole Bible. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, even if the worst thing that you can possibly imagine happens, Habakkuk says, yet I will rejoice. Yet I will rejoice. And isn't it striking that he says, rejoice. He doesn't say, yet I will survive. He doesn't say, even if everything is going wrong, even if all of my luxuries and all of my basic necessities for life are stripped away from me. I'll submit to God and I will get by somehow. He doesn't say that. He says, I will rejoice. Even if these things are happening, I'll rejoice. I will be filled with joy. I will be glad. I will praise God. Well, how can he say this? How can he rejoice when it seems that there is nothing at all to rejoice about? Well, the reason is because his joy and his happiness ultimately are not invested in anything in this world. No, the happiness of the believer, the happiness of the one who lives by faith is rooted in God. It is bound up with who God is and not what God gives him. I will rejoice, Habakkuk says, in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Even if all the gifts dry up, Habakkuk says, I will still love the Lord. I will still have the Lord. I will still delight in the Lord. Hopefully, a wife doesn't love her husband because of the nice presents that he buys her from time to time. Of course, the presents are very welcome. It's nice to get presents. Uh, it's nice particularly because of what those gifts represent, what they signify. They're tokens of a husband's love for his wife. It reminds her that he's thinking about her. But even if that husband never bought a gift for his wife ever again, and I'm not suggesting those of you men who are married that you should try this or put this to the test, but even if he never bought his wife a present ever again, she would still love him, wouldn't she? Because her love and her joy in her husband don't depend on the gifts. They're not conditional on the gifts. They're rooted in him, who he is as a person. Yes, she appreciates the presence, but she loves her husband. And that's what Habakkuk is saying here. Even if the gifts dry up, even if the fruit and the oil and even the food itself stop coming, it doesn't change anything for Habakkuk because he loves God for who God is and not because of the gifts that God sends him. The gifts are the bonus, the icing on the cake, but God, God himself is the real treasure. And that's why we sang 
Psalm 16, verse 2, where the psalmist says much the same kind of thing. You are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. Psalm 73, verse 25. Earth has nothing I desire, the psalmist says, besides you. I wonder, can you say that this morning? Can you rejoice in the Lord, even if everything else is taken away? It's a constant temptation for us to find our joy in God's gifts rather than the giver. So many people fall into the trap of thinking that other people are the secret to happiness or other things will make them happy and bring fulfillment and satisfaction to their lives. And so that's where they invest their hopes and their dreams. That's what many young people do with education. They think that if they just get the right grades, if they just get the right qualifications, if they get on the right university course or the right career path, that that will make them happy. It's assessments and results and prizes that hold the secret of happiness. Getting a fulfilling and interesting job that stretches them and that uh, is suited to their gifts and that they succeed at and excel in, then they'll be fulfilled, then they'll be happy. Some people think that it's money that will provide that happiness. If they're making a certain level of income if their investment portfolio, portfolio and their saving funds, if those things are performing well, if they have plenty of disposable income, then they'll be happy. Then life will be good. And so if they can just get to that next tier on the income ladder, then they will, they will have made it. Or for some people, it's possessions. That's what they think will make them happy. Buying things. It might be a new book, it might be a new pencil, it might be a new car, it might be a new piece of kit for a hobby, a new gadget, it might be new clothes, new anything, new something. That's what will make me happy. If I just had that thing, that would make my life complete. For some people, it's a relationship. If I just had a boyfriend or a girlfriend, or if I were just married instead of single, then life would be complete. Then I'd be happy. Then I would be able to serve the Lord with gladness. Then I could rejoice. I need someone that I can share my life with, someone that I can talk to, someone who will uh, share intimacy with me, who will take care of me, who will love me. That's what I need. That's what I want more than anything in the world. But if we put our joy, our trust for joy in any created thing, then we are headed for disappointment because it can't bear the weight of our expectations. It can't support our faith and our trust in it. It can't deliver the joy that we're looking for and expecting from it. It can't do that. It can't do that because, for one thing, it's uncertain. It can all be taken away. You could lose that job. You could miss out on that promotion that you've set your heart on. We're seeing at the moment in a very uh, stark way just how the economy can nosedive and how our investments can lose all their value. Our possessions can be lost. They can be stolen. They can be destroyed in a fire or a flood. A marriage can turn sour when you discover that your husband or your wife is not the person that you thought they were. Serious illness can come and disrupt the peaceful, happy life, the track that you had mapped out in your mind for your life. Don't trust in things or in people for your happiness, for your joy, because they're uncertain. 
But then, most importantly of all, don't trust in people and things for your joy because they're not God. Our souls cannot be satisfied by anything other than God. Other people and things can stave off our hunger for God for a while. But in the end, it's only the Lord who can truly satisfy us. He has made us for himself. And our hearts are restless until they find their rest in him. So said Augustine. We get a buzz from that promotion or that financial windfall or the new car, but it soon wears off, doesn't it? Surprisingly quickly. God alone is infinitely, eternally, unchangeably glorious and good and perfect. And we can never, ever tire of him. And so we need to say, like Habakkuk says here, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in God, my Savior. We need to look to him for our joy, not to anything in this world. And then when we do that, we can enjoy God's good gifts in the right way. Because he's given us these things. He's given us all things richly to enjoy. And we're meant to enjoy them, but in their proper place. I'm not for a moment suggesting that we're only to take delight in God and that we're never to take any pleasure in anything else. That we're not allowed to enjoy our marriage, that we're not allowed to enjoy our children or our work or our hobbies. These are all good things that God intends for us, that he has designed for us to enjoy. And not just to enjoy, but to enjoy richly. The problem comes when we focus on the gifts as if they are the most important thing. When we make a good thing into a God thing, as it were. When we take something that is earthly and we treat it as if it is ultimate, as if it is like God himself. When we blow things out of all proportion so that they matter more to us than God. It's really breaking the first commandment, isn't it? You shall have no other gods before me. But we take these things, these created things that God made, and we treat them, we revere them, we worship them as if they are gods. And then when these things are taken away, when the fig tree doesn't blossom, and there's no fruit on the vines, and the produce of the olive fails, and the fields are yielding no food, then we feel as if life isn't worth living anymore because we've tied our joy and our happiness and our well-being to these things. And when they go, so does our happiness. We need to be able to say, like Habakkuk, even if I lose everything, yet I can still rejoice because my joy is invested in God. Nothing can separate me from his love that is in Christ Jesus. Disaster envisaged. Faith displayed. And then thirdly and lastly in verse 19, we see the strength provided. Strength provided. How is this possible? What, Haga, what, what Habakkuk is doing here seems superhuman. Where can we get this faith that Habakkuk displays? Does he work it up by a huge act of willpower? Is that how he does it? He just happens to be a person of great faith. Well, no. We see in verse 19 that this faith and this joy comes from God himself. God, the Lord, is my strength. God, the Lord, 
is my strength. In a sense, what he is doing here is supernatural, isn't it? Because it's not natural to say, even if all that I have is taken away, I will rejoice in the Lord. No, this is the result of a supernatural work of God in Habakkuk's heart. Remember what Jesus said to that uh, to his disciples after his discussion with the rich young ruler in Matthew 19:24. He said, "It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God." In other words, it's impossible. Humans can't make themselves delight in God more than money. But do you remember what Jesus went on to say? With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. All things are possible with God. So don't despair. If you think that Habakkuk's faith is unreachable for you, if you think that it's impossible that you could ever genuinely, sincerely say these words, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, then you've got to listen to what he says in verse 19. God the Lord is my strength. With man, this is impossible, but not with God. In fact, Habakkuk goes even further, doesn't he, in the rest of verse 19. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. Not only is he rejoicing in God, he's like a sure-footed deer running over rocky, steep slopes without slipping. He's saying that the man or the woman who lives by faith is able to triumph over all adversity by God's grace. He's able to confront all kinds of troubles without being cast down. This language here in verse 19 echoes Deuteronomy 33 verse 13, where God is talking about how he's going to bring his people into the promised land at the time of the Exodus. And he says, he made him, that's Israel, he made Israel ride on the heights of the land and fed him with the fruit of the fields. He nourished him with honey from the rock and with oil from the flinty crag, with curds and milk from the herd and the flock, and with fattened lambs and goats, with choice rams of Bashan and the finest kernels of wheat. You drank the foaming blood of the grape. In the wilderness, as God was bringing Israel to the promised land, when they had nothing, God provided them with all these things. They trusted him and he provided them with them. All these things that are mentioned here in, Hag in Habakkuk 3.17. Habakkuk is looking forward in faith to a time when God is going to restore the blessings that his people are about to lose. Yes, the Babylonians are going to come. And yes, they're going to ravage the land. And yes, for a time, the fig tree isn't going to blossom. And there won't be fruit on the vines. And there won't be olives. And there won't be food in the fields. But that suffering, that affliction, is only temporary. And in the end, God is going to pour out his blessing upon his people. And give them all that they need. And as Christians, we have that same hope, don't we? No matter what sufferings and losses we endure in this life, in the end, Jesus Christ is going to bring us through the wilderness to the promised land. He's going to satisfy every need and every desire that we have. We have hope like that lady in Hyderabad loudly in her sewer pipe, singing for joy, surrounded by nothing, because she knew that she belonged to the Lord and that she has a glorious future 
in store. And that in the present, God will give her what he knows she needs. That's what's in store for us. Revelation 7 verse 15 gives us a picture of heaven. And just listen to how it's described. He who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. Amen. Well, let's bow our heads in prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, in these days when it's not hard at all to imagine uh, so much of the luxury as well as even basic necessities being taken from us, we pray that our hope will be founded, our faith will rest, our joy will be invested in God the Lord. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be teaching us in these days not to look to the things of this world for our joy, for satisfaction, but to look to you alone. Father, in these last few weeks, we have felt in our affluent society just the merest breath of what it's like to go without things, or to have that abundance supply threatened, to have to wait for things that before we could instantly have at any time, day or night. We thank you, Father, for how this has humbled us and perhaps brought us to a closer dependence upon you for our daily bread. Father, we do pray that whether you have to strip away even more or not, we pray that we will be able to say like Habakkuk, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Father, we do pray for any who are not Christians and whose joy and hope is entirely invested in the things of this world which cannot satisfy now and which will only destroy in the future. We pray that you would bring them this very day to see that you alone are the rock, that in you alone is our joy safe. We pray, Father, that you will have mercy upon them, bring them to trust in you, We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's close our worship time together by singing praise from Psalm 18. Psalm 18 on page 29 in the psalm book. We're going to sing stanzas 24 to 29. Psalm 18 Stanzas 24 to 29. Habakkuk is echoing these verses in the very last verse of his prophecy. Stanza 28. He makes my feet as sure as deer's. On my heights makes me stand. He trains my hands for war. My arms a bow of bronze can bend. And really that sums up the theme of these stanzas. By God's grace... God's people can stand firm and do impossible things. Psalm 18, 24 to 29, let us praise God. 
afflicted people you will save, what proud eyes you bring low. You light my lamp, the Lord my God, my darkness night and so. By you a troop of men I charge, and cause them down to fall. And by my God assisting me, I can be born a war. For perfect is the way of God, the Lord's word it is tried. He is a shield to all of those who do in him who but the Lord is God, who else but God's a rock, I say. It's God who clothes me with his strength, and perfect makes my way. He makes my feet as sure as deer's, on my heights makes me stand. He trains my hands for war, my arms a bow of bronze can bend. The shield of your salvation you upon me did bestow. Your right hand holds me up, and great your kindness makes me grow. grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.